This is another fun feature here in the shop, these fly swatters that look like flies. It takes a disgusting thing that you don't really want to do and turns it into a fun and joyful activity. Joyfully murder flies. Howdy Skillshare, come on in. Would love to show you my studio, shop, and workshop. My name's Jessica Hish, and I'm a lettering artist and author, and here we are in my beautiful downtown Oakland studio. And below my studio here is a brick and mortar store that I opened this year. I've been in this space since early 2020. We actually got the space in 2018 and then built it out and then it was just about done right before the pandemic. Originally, these were two units that were side by side owned by a couple who had intended on combining them just like I ended up doing. And so we worked with an architect about making my sort of dream studio. Originally, my husband and I were gonna split the space, but we sort of realized that most of what he wants to do creatively can't be done in a more residential neighborhood. And so it became all mine, selfishly, I was very happy. And so it's really kind of Barbie's creative dream house. The top floor is my office space and it's about 800 square feet. I work at a desk and I have a couple of studio mates. I also do printmaking up here as well. And then downstairs, right below where I'm standing, is my print workshop, which started as just my letterpress and then grew into a laser cutter, a CNC router, some jewelry making supplies. I tend to just acquire uh, maker tools anytime I have any kind of surplus in my bank account. <laughs> and then the other side of downstairs is a retail store. And originally, that's always what I intended it to be. There's a big picture window between the store and the makerspace downstairs so that when you're in the shop, you can actually look into the workshop and see all the printmaking machines and stuff and kind of really feel a connection between the tools and the art that you're about to buy. I've always been really interested in being able to physically produce things myself. The second that I think about like, oh, this can be a print, oh, this can be a cut out piece of acrylic, it gets me really excited to think about creating something. And so owning the means of production is an investment up front, but it also means that every single time that I wanna make something, I get this instant gratification of being able to make it almost the exact same day. So here we have my workstation where all the magic happens. And by magic, I mean typically drawing and vectorizing things. And so I do almost all my sketches on my iPad Pro here in Procreate. And then what I do is I send that sketch over here to my computer and then tend to trace my sketches. So once I have my artwork done here, depending on how I wanna end up printing it, there's sort of a different process. For the Resograph, the Resograph does not have Wi-Fi capabilities because I think it's from like 2004. And so I plug directly into that via an old printer port, but I can actually print straight from Illustrator. If I'm gonna letterpress print this, I have to actually send away to get photopolymer plates made. So photopolymer plates take my art and they burn it onto a thin sheet of photopolymer that I can then use to do relief printing on the letterpress. For that, I send my art away, it gets back in the mail to me, and then basically Basically all I have to do is just put my plate on the press, ink it up, and we're ready to rock and roll. Well, not all offices have this, but my office has a shrine to myself. Part of this is just because so much of the work that I do actually gets physically produced, which is really amazing. Like not everybody has the opportunity to work on things that get made into real objects in the real world. I've done a ton of book covers for different kinds of books and for different publishers. This whole series here is all for Barnes & Noble. So I wasn't really commissioned as like an artist series to do it. They just hired me cover after cover after cover over the course of 10 years. This series here was actually an artist collaboration. So Penguin commissioned me to make 26 book covers for this series called Penguin Drop Caps, which was inspired by my Daily Drop Cap project. So this is the very first edition print that I made of my first alphabet that I did for that project in which I illustrated 26 letters 12 times in a row. And so it ended up being a really big, big project, but I really wanted to sort of commemorate the very first alphabet. So I ended up making this two color print. So this here is my Rezograph, also known as a Rezo. 
And so Arezzo is essentially a copy machine and screen printing like they had a baby and made a fun art making device. And so these guys are really popular in schools and things like that because what they're really good at is churning out a lot of prints very quickly and very cheaply. But like screen printing, they can only print one color at a time. What you're gonna end up having if you have Arezzo is lots of color drums, one for each color that you wanna print. Most people just have like between four and six. Um, I have 12 because I'm a little extra. Once you actually have the machine in your space, there's very little investment. So like the actual friction to creating a new piece of art is almost nothing. The way that it works is that the inside guts of the machine look almost like a nuclear core reactor. You get these individual drums that come on through and as you send a print through from either the scan bed or your computer, it then burns a screen which wraps around the drum and then the ink gets pushed through the screen to actually make your artwork. So you can actually see it's a very physical art making process. Uh, these things are pretty heavy. So when you're printing multiple colors, you're basically having like the upper, the arms workout of your life. So it's arms day every time it's a Rezo day. And then the masters are actually a roll of paper. And so this roll of paper here, um, what'll happen is your design, as it pulls the, the paper through the machine, it burns a design into it. And then that gets wrapped around the drum. And so just with these two little drums, you get all the artwork that you instantly want, which is amazing. While there's definitely plenty of my art in this space, I don't actually like having my artwork all over the walls surrounding me. So when I was thinking about designing the space and actually just what was gonna be on the walls, one artist that I couldn't get out of my head is my friend Martha Rich, who's based in Philadelphia. And she does these incredible murals that look like speech bubbles that are all talking to each other. Sometimes they're painted murals and sometimes they're cut out pieces of wood that are mounted to walls. So I commissioned her to make a piece for this wall. So what we did, it was really collaborative. She kind of like picked my brain about things that I was interested in. She knows that I have Philly roots. She knows a lot about me because we've known each other for many years. And so one day they just all showed up. It was a big surprise. I had no idea what things were gonna be. And then the way that she works with people that commission her is that she doesn't actually tell them how to hang pieces, which was kind of a, you know, intimidating thing to think about. As a part of her process, I ended up spending days like mapping everything out on the floor, figuring out what was gonna talk to what, what the conversations were gonna be between the bubbles and the pieces and whatnot. And so the idea that it's all sort of emanating out of this cactus was totally a fluke of me just wanting to create this really fun shape on the wall. But there are some really interesting moments where things are very specific in how they talk to each other. So right now we're in my workshop. So the workshop is sort of my tinker maker space that exists below my office. So inside this space, I have a lot of different kinds of equipment. It started with my Vandercook letterpress, which was originally in the backyard of my house in Oakland. And then after that, I started acquiring a few other pieces. So this guy here is my CNC router. And this came about because I have a laser cutter, but laser cutters can only cut acrylic and wood and other soft materials. So they can't cut through metal or glass or things like that. So I really wanted a way to be able to cut metal because I was tinkering around with doing jewelry. So one of the things that I was tinkering with was thinking about making charms um, for necklaces. And so this is one of the charms that I sort of did as a prototype. It's this artwork that I made that says tight. And then ultimately what I would do is attach a chain and pop it onto a necklace like that. So one of the most magical pieces that I have in my workshop is this Glowforge laser cutter. I can just plug my computer in, upload a file to this cloud software that they have, and then instantly create something that cuts out. So here are some of the pieces that I made on this. I got really into the idea of doing inlays and using multiple materials. So this is wood that was laser cut onto here and then rubbed down with oil. And then um, this inset into it is a pearlescent acrylic. So I cut two pieces and then sort of like fit them together. And I tried this same design a few different ways. So this one uses an opaque acrylic and then a clear acrylic. And I just really love the effect of like being able to see through the material. 
This last one, I was taking two opaque materials. One is a mirror acrylic, which has a backer to it, which is actually what causes the mirror. And then the other is just a solid opaque red acrylic. And sometimes using the same piece of art over and over again with different materials yields such different results that you then all of a sudden start to see what the piece wants to be. It really is this surprise, awesome magic moment where you feel like an actual artist <laughs> instead of a designer that's just, you know, tinkering away on a computer all the time. So this is a recent acquisition. Uh, this is a hot foil stamping machine. And so I was really excited about this because Prior to this, I couldn't do any foil stamping here in the studio. And there was a creator that I followed online that was doing a lot of cards and stationery and was using this press. And I hadn't seen a platen press, which is this sort of clamshell press before for foil um, at this scale. I haven't used this guy yet, but to give you an example of something that foil that you can do with foil is this piece here. I actually had Studio on Fire print it for me, but this is not only a uh, silver foil stamped design, but it also has an emboss on it. And so you can see there's like a multi-level sculptural emboss, and that's something that you can do with foil stamping that you can't do with letterpress or that you can't do easily with letterpress. So here we have my 1940s Vandercook 4, which I purchased from a lady friend of mine who purchased from another lady friend. It has lady lineage. And so this guy weighs about 1,200 pounds. It can print up to 13 by 19. And letterpress is a form of relief printing. And so this is called a cylinder press. And so a cylinder press has a cylinder that rolls over the print rather than a clamshell press which kind of takes two parts and claps them together. I love this printer because I really love repetitive work. Um, I find it to be very soothing. And so it's a very physical way of creation. I can get a plate made, a polymer plate made of my work, put it on the press, and then print hundreds of prints at a time, just going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, really getting into a very meditative state. So what I do is just squeeze a ribbon of ink onto this top roller here. And then when we have our machine on, I can set this thing rolling and our press starts to ink itself up. So the first time that we ink our plates, I'm gonna have this on trip so that it's not, the cylinder's not dropped onto the press itself. And so I just roll this guy over it and roll it on back. And we have ourselves an inked plate to pull a print, there's a little foot pedal down here that I press down with my foot and it lifts these guides up. And so I push my paper up against the guides and then they help trap the paper in place. So now I don't have to hold the paper anymore. And then all I have to do is make sure that I'm switched to print and then pull my print. And there you go. That's our final print coming through the machine. Now that you've seen the workshop, let's head over to the store so you can see where all the prints end up. First thing that we do when we open the shop is open up the shade between the space. When I originally designed the space, I really wanted to make sure that people, when they were inside the store, could look into the workshop and really see where the prints are being made and the machines that they're being made on. So many of the pieces that you see online that are produced are print on demand in a factory style setting and not necessarily made by hand by makers. So I felt like that was a really important part of the shop. So welcome to Jessica Hish and Friends, which is the name of my shop. I named it that because I knew that a lot of people would be just Googling like Jessica Hish's store to try to find this place, but I wanted to open it up to be more than just my work. So in the shop, everything that is a print or you know a piece of artwork is by me. Other than that, it's all curated pieces by other people, hopefully friends or, or aspiring friends, I say. And everything that's not a print or a book has to have both beauty and utility. So that's the big thing in the shop is that there's no tchotchkes. It's all stuff that has to be both useful and beautiful. So a little known fact about me, maybe actually quite well known because I documented on Instagram, is that I love shopping. A lot of times when people travel, they go to museums or they go to galleries and that's how they perceive that place. You know, like when you go to a museum, you get a sense of things that were created in that space um, over a period of time. But 
Museums and galleries are sort of a snapshot of a time in the past, whereas I feel like boutiques and small stores that are curated with local goods tend to be a snapshot of the now, of today. And I just really love being able to see what people are creating in different spaces. And so the piece that I want to share about with you guys today is this amazing pencil sharpener, which I feel like inspired this whole store. So I bought this guy when I was in Shoreditch, England from one of these such stores that sort of showcases individual items that are like of repute. This pencil sharpener was sort of lauded as like, if you're gonna have a pencil sharpener, have this pencil sharpener. Not only does it work perfectly as a pencil sharpener, but it's gorgeous and it's milled out of solid aluminum and just has this like really nice, a uh, perfectly smooth way of coming undone. And then one of the things that's sort of like a little fun surprise is that when you put it down on the table, it actually casts this little sort of prism of light onto the table. So not only does it become this object that's useful, but it becomes this little moment of beauty in your space. And so I always am thinking about that as I'm buying stuff for the store. What can I do to take an everyday object that we, that we use, not just an everyday object that we see, and make an activity that would generally be joyless or just thoughtless and turn it into a moment that we can like appreciate and love. Another great part about the store is that I do write and illustrate children's books and people can come to the shop when I'm working and actually get them personalized and autographed. So it creates this other really fun moment because the kids' books especially become these really important moments in the life of a parent. And it's really cool that I get to be a part of that, but even cooler that I get to have the opportunity to meet some of these kids who love my books and then sign their name and tell them all about what I do. And they get to really get insight into what it's like to be a creator as well by just being in the space. So this showpiece of the store is this massive point of sale desk, which was quite an effort to both uh, design and build, apparently. My builder was very uh, unhappy with <laughs> how complicated the design was. But I really love the idea of being able to showcase pens and scissors. Another more unexpected thing that I sell in the shop are glasses. And that's mostly because I have a very unique pair of eyeglasses and people ask me about them all the time. They're by a designer called Masahiro Maruyama. And so I wanted to be able to direct people to a place to buy them. And so I buy them so that you may buy them from me. And then as we move through the case, I've got my sharp objects uh, showcase here. I really love scissors and I feel like, again, you should have many pairs of scissors. If you only have one pair of scissors, then that pair of scissors is disgusting and broken. And so you need fabric scissors, you need paper scissors, you need kitchen scissors, you need all kinds. So I've also got a few different kinds of pens in here. And I don't really carry a ton of extremely expensive stuff in the shop. So most of the things in the store are under $100 and actually the vast majority of things are under $40. I wanted it to be a place where you can actually buy gifts for others and not just for yourself. Over on this wall, we have our wall of notebooks. I try to have a good representation of different kinds of notebooks. Then we've got our clocks, our wall of prints, and lots of little fun, small stuff. As I love to make enamel pins and aspire to make patches, I knew that I had to have a patches and pins wall to both sell my own prints and also curate a bunch of ones that I really loved. And so these are all really fun. Some of my favorites are, uh, there's one that says graphic designers aren't my type, very graphic design specific one. Um, this one really did numbers on Instagram. This uh, bumper sticker that says, honk if you aren't going to eat your pickle and I can have it. So both of these are by World Famous Original. And so this is again, like a really fun uh, way for me to just curate things that I see online and love. Remember when you saw these guys upstairs? I printed these cards on the Rezo and then folded them on my scoring machine across the way and then put them into little envelopes upstairs at my desk. So again, like means of production, just right here, right now, able to make these things and put them on the shelf. One of the things that was a big impetus for opening the shop was actually wanting to feel more like a local and more involved in my local community. You know, I've been here for 12 years now. I've got three kids in the public schools. I feel like we're going to be here probably for the greater part of the rest of my life. I really want to be more involved in the local community and having a physical space that other people have access to is definitely one of the easiest pathways to make that happen. Thanks so much for coming to the studio and store today. I hope to see you here in downtown Oakland. I'm usually upstairs every weekday or down here when the shop's open. So please come by anytime. Bye.